Hello there, everybody. Welcome back to ITTV. For today's lesson, let's focus on the lymphatic system. For today's lesson, we look at the lymphatic system and there are many learning outcomes. Firstly, to describe the formation of interstitial fluid, to state the composition of interstitial fluid, to state the importance of interstitial fluid, to describe the fate of interstitial fluid, to describe the structure of the lymphatic system and to explain how the lymphatic system complements the circulatory system to also compare the contents of blood, interstitial fluid and lymph, to predict what will happen if the interstitial fluid fails to return to circulatory system, to conceptualize the relationship between the lymphatic system and the circulatory system. So let's look at what is the interstitial fluid. The interstitial fluid surrounds and bathes cells of multicellular animals. The composition is similar to blood plasma but lacks erythrocytes, platelets and plasma proteins. It is because these uh, molecules are large and cannot pass through the walls of the blood capillaries, which are much smaller. So, how is the interstitial fluid formed? During the flow of blood from the arteries to the capillaries, the high hydrostatic pressure at the arterial ends of the capillaries forces some of the blood fluid out of the capillary walls into the intercellular spaces to form the interstitial fluid. And if you refer to the diagram, that basically um, at the um, arterial end of the capillaries, um, there would be um, you know, a high hydrostatic pressure that forces the blood fluid out of the capillary walls into the intercellular space, as you can refer to the diagram. And there will be some lymph capillaries there, whereby 10% of this uh, fluid will actually be absorbed back into the lymph capillary, whereas 9% will be reabsorbed back into the venule end of the capillaries. Now, what is the importance of the interstitial fluid? The interstitial fluid which bathes the body cells allows the exchange of gases, nutrients and waste products between the cells and the blood plasma in the blood capillaries. Nutrients and oxygen diffuse from the blood via the interstitial fluid to the cells. Waste products such as carbon dioxide and urea diffuse from the cells via the interstitial fluid to the blood. So let us look to the board to see how this actually works out. So these are the cells, okay? These are the cells of the body. And every cell will have a nucleus. And generally there are some um, interstitial fluid. So the interstitial fluid, okay? So interstitial fluid. Okay? Interstitial fluid that bathes the cells basically surrounding the, surrounding the cells. So basically if let's say the capillaries are here, enlarged, these are the capillaries which are enlarged. So let's say this part here would be would be the arterial. So this will be the arterial end of the capillaries. So basically, um, the fluid is forced out through hydrostatic pressure, and of course, uh, later on, some of the fluid will be reabsorbed back. So this will be the venule, okay, venule. So in the venule part of the capillary, some of the interstitial fluid will be reabsorbed back inside. I didn't draw the lymph capillaries for clarity. So as you can see in this part here, um, well, some of the fluid will be forced out, 
but all the red blood cells will still remain in the capillaries. Red blood cells, for example. Okay, I hope that you can see clearly. So red blood cells will still be left in the capillaries. And then of course, the smaller platelets also. The smaller platelet cells will also remain in the capillary. So basically, a process of diffusion happens whereby carbon dioxide, urea, diffuses out, out from the cells because they're waste products. But what goes inside are precious oxygen, right? precious uh, nutrients that will diffuse from the interstitial fluid into the cells. So this is basically the whole process that was explained in the last 10 minutes. That basically the interstitial fluid is the fluid bathing the cells and what diffuses from the cells will be the waste products such as CO2 and urea. What diffuses into the cells are the precious nutrients and the much needed oxygen. So the red blood cells, the white blood cells, the platelets remain in the capillaries because they're too large to diffuse out from the capillary wall and at this part of the capillary which is nearer to the venule some of the 90% of the interstitial fluid will diffuse back into the capillaries. So that's basically the whole mechanism of how interstitial fluid is formed and the importance of the interstitial fluid. So what is lymph? About 10% of the interstitial fluid flows into the lymphatic capillaries of the lymphatic system to form lymph. The remaining 90% of the interstitial fluid flows back into the venous end of the capillary system to be returned to the blood circulation. So as you can see, that um, the formation of the interstitial fluid is just part of the mechanism for the exchange of the nutrients and waste products to happen. So that the cells get the much needed nutrients which are originally in the capillaries and the cells can actually remove their toxic and waste products through the interstitial fluid which is actually returned back to the, um, to the blood circulation. So it's, that means the interstitial fluid is acting like an intermediate uh, portion between the blood and the cells. And because not 100% of the interstitial fluid can actually return back to the blood circulation, 10% will actually flow into the lymphatic capillaries to form what we call as lymph, while 90% will actually flow back into the capillaries. So what is lymph? Now, lymph is a colourless fluid found in the lymphatic vessels. Its composition is quite the same as the interstitial fluid except it contains a high number of lymphocytes. And we'll look at what the meaning of lymphocytes are, but they're specifically certain immune cells, very important to protect and to strengthen our immune system. Now let's move on to something else because we looked at the formation and importance of interstitial fluid as well as the lymph. Let's look at oedema. Oedema is a condition which happens when the excess of interstitial fluid does not flow back into the blood circulatory system but accumulates in the intercellular space and causes swelling of tissues. And Elephantiasis is a disease that is characterized by the thickening of the skin and underlying tissues, especially in the legs and male genitals. It is caused by blockage of lymphatic vessels by parasitic filarial worms, as you can see in the diagram, that this person's legs are actually swollen and the skin is thickened because of um, elephantiasis which is basically the swallowing of the tissues because the interstitial fluid does not actually flow back into the blood circulatory system. Now, 
The lymphatic system consists of lymphatic capillaries, lymphatic vessels, lymph nodes at the neck, armpits and the groin, and lymphoid organs which consist of the thymus gland, spleen and tonsils. So we looked at one of the conditions or consequences due to um, swelling of tissue because of some interstitial fluid that does not flow back into the capillaries because that is what it's supposed to do. 90% of this interstitial fluid which was uh, you know, bathing the cells in the intercellular space is supposed to return back into the blood circulation via the capillaries. But if it remains between the cells, it will actually cause the tissues to swell up resulting in conditions like elephantiasis which is a very sad condition. Then, now we looked at the lymphatic system and if you refer to the diagram, it actually shows you different parts of the lymphatic system. And the lymphoid organs are consisting of the thymus gland as you can notice. We have spleen and tonsils as well. So when we have a sore throat, our tonsils will actually be enlarged, red and inflamed. It's because um, you know the lymphocytes in the tonsils are actually trying to fight against the germs that are causing us to have a sore throat. Then we look at um, the structure and function of a lymph node. Now, lymph nodes generally occur in groups at intervals along the larger lymphatic vessels. They are distributed throughout the body in areas such as the neck, the armpits, the groins. All lymph nodes have the primary function of the production of lymphocytes which help defend the body against the microorganisms. And the lymph nodes filter out microorganisms such as bacteria and viruses and foreign substances such as toxins and poisons and etc. So if you look at the picture of the, of the lymph nodes, um, it's actually consisting of follicles that produce lymphocytes as observed with the purplish uh, portions. And um, we have unfiltered lymph going through one part, going through several parts of the nodes and out coming out at the bottom part will be the filtered lymph. And in the follicles, there are phagocytes which will kill the pathogens and even some cancer cells. So if our lymph nodes are not working so well, then pathogens will be able to invade our bodies and even possibly cancer can be caused because phagocytes and lymph nodes are one of our defences against pathogens and even um, the possibility of cancer. Now, Moving on, let's look further into the lymphatic system. Lymph flows through the lymphatic vessels aided by the contraction of the surrounding skeletal muscles. And the flow of lymph is also aided by perit peristalsis in the alimentary canal um, as well as breathing movements during inhalation and exhalation. So you can see that the flow of lymph is usually in only one direction. Um, because the presence of valves in the larger vessels ensures that lymph flows in one direction as one end of lymphatic vessel is closed. So it is good that there is this mechanism in place to ensure that the movement of lymph is only one direction and this is aided by the presence of certain valves. Now, and if you refer to the diagram, this shows the total lymphatic system that is consisting of several nodes that are found in clusters and groups throughout the body at several junctions of the lymphatic vessels. We have um, lymphatic collecting vessels in the thigh and in the arms and we have entrance of the right lymphatic duct into the right subclavian vein. If you can see, that's the internal jugular vein and we have the entrance of the thoracic duct into the left subclavian vein. And you can even notice the position of the thoracic duct. Okay? So what is important if you notice will be the right and the left subclavian veins. So the lymphatic system is actually consisting 
of lymphatic capillaries which move into the lymphatic vessels, lymph nodes, lymphatic ducts and the subclavian veins. The flow chart shows the flow of lymph in the lymphatic system starting from the lymphatic capillaries all the way to the subclavian veins and we had just now looked at the diagram that we had the left and the right subclavian veins. So, if you were to notice, the lymphatic capillaries actually converge into larger vessels which we call the lymphatic vessels. And lymphatic vessels have lymph nodes that phagocytes uh, filter and they destroy foreign particles such as bacteria and viruses. And the lymphatic vessels will empty their contents into the left and right subclavian veins via the thoracic duct and the right lymphatic ducts. So let us have a look at this um, a little bit clearer. If you move on to the next slide, um, you know, with a flow chart, it will help you in your understanding of the movement of the lymph through the lymphatic system. Okay, so basically, if you refer to the flow chart, lymph from the lymphatic vessels throughout the whole body drains into two major lymphatic vessels, which would be the right lymphatic duct and the thoracic duct. Um, for your information, the thoracic duct happens to be the largest vessel in the body. The right lymphatic duct drains lymph from the right side of the head, neck and chest as well as the right arm into the right subclavian vein. So the duct will drain lymph from the right side into the right subclavian vein. While the thoracic duct, if you were to refer to the slide, it drains lymph from the left side of the head, neck, chest, left arm, the lower trunk and both legs all into the left subclavian vein. So basically, the thoracic duct drains lymph from the left side of our entire body from head, legs into the left subclavian vein which is a major lymphatic vessel. As a result, the lymph which originally came from the blood is eventually returned to the blood circulatory system. And it's a really wonderful process how originally the 10% of the interstitial fluid which did not return back to the capillaries, that at first it was actually flowed through the lymphatic system. It's a marvellous way that this 10% of interstitial fluid is finally, finally returned back into the blood circulatory system system via the two major lymphatic vessels which would be the left subclavian um, which would be the right lymphatic duct and the thoracic duct. So if you refer back to the diagram, um, the thoracic duct would be one of the one of the major lymphatic vessels as well as the right lymphatic duct. Now let us move on to the role of the lymphatic system. The main function of the lymphatic system is to collect interstitial fluid and return it to the blood circulatory system. The lymphatic capillaries called lacteals in the ileum absorb fatty acids, glycerol and fat-soluble vitamins and transport them back into the blood circulatory system. So as I mentioned just now, that the major basic function of the lymphatic system, the goal is to return back the incidental fluid back to the circulatory system. And it happens through a series of um, a series of process. It flows from lymphatic capillaries to the vessels. It flows through the nodes, ending into the two major lymphatic ducts, which will be the right lymphatic duct and the thoracic duct. Finally, ending into the right and to the left subclavian veins. So it is such a wonderful way to return back the incidental fluid back into the blood circulatory system. Now, do you know how a lactyl actually looks like? Because lactyls are special type of lymphatic capillaries in the small intestine. And let me draw for you a picture of the lactyl. So, this here is a picture of a microvilus. 
and inside will be a picture of the lacteal. So this is basically the lacteal, okay? And then surrounding it will be the blood capillaries, okay? So I'll just draw some simple blood capillaries. Blood capillaries is why I draw red. Okay, so the blood capillaries would actually So surrounding the lacteal would be the blood capillaries. So the lacteal is actually in a microvillus and the capillaries are surrounding the lacteal. And what happens will be that as the, as the fluid is in the small intestine, the vitamins that are soluble in fats, glycerol, as well as certain fatty acids will be absorbed into the lacteal. Be absorbed into the lacteal. Okay, so as you can see from here, what will be absorbed into the lacteal? Into the lacteal will basically be um, fatty acids. glycerol as well as some fat soluble vitamins fat soluble vitamins like A, D, E and K so this the middle part again is the lacteal this part here this part here is the lacteal okay I hope that you are able to see the middle part is the lacteal and all these components will be absorbed into the lacteal of the, um, of the microvillus. So as you can see, the lacteal was a special lymphatic capillary to also return some interstitial fluid back into the blood circulatory system. Now, um, what about the role of the lymph nodes? The lymph nodes filter up microorganisms such as bacteria and viruses and foreign substances such as toxins as was mentioned earlier. The lymph nodes also manufacture lymphocytes which produce antibodies to destroy pathogens and neutralize toxins. So with that, we have finished the theory part of the lymphatic system, the roles and the importance. Now let us look at some tests to help in your understanding. Firstly, the function of the lymphatic system are number one, to produce antibodies, to filter foreign particles, to carry oxygen and carbon dioxide, and to transport red blood cells. So, if you just run through the options A, B, C, D, so what do you roughly think is the answer for this question on the functions of the lymphatic system? Now, as you can see, um, lymphatic system, as you know, they have the lymph nodes. The lymph nodes are also there to produce phagocytes, to produce lymphocytes. And lymphocytes, specifically uh, the B lymphocytes, are there to produce antibodies. So, number one is correct, to produce antibodies. Number two, um, I just mentioned that the lymph nodes are there to filter out microorganisms and foreign particles. So number two is definitely right. But lymphatic system is not to carry oxygen and carbon dioxide. That will be the function of the blood. To transport red blood cells, also the function of the blood. 
So the answer will be A, which will be 1 and 2. Now, let us look at the second question. Interstitial fluid has composition similar to blood but lacks erythrocytes, platelets and plasma proteins. So why is it so? A. It is because erythrocytes, platelets and plasma proteins are heavy molecules. It is because erythrocytes, platelets and plasma proteins cause damage to lymphatic system. Or is it because erythrocytes, platelets and plasma proteins are components of blood? D. It is because they are all too large and cannot pass through capillary walls. Now, what do you think is the answer for this? It's quite simple. Now, do not be tricked that it's not option A. It's not because they're heavy, but because they're too large to pass through the capillary walls. Thereby, the answer is D. That they are all too large to actually, um, you know, pass through the capillary walls. Now, how about the next question? Which of this is the correct sequence for the flow of lymph in the lymphatic system? Now, I would like you to just skim through options A, B, C and D. But basically, all of them involve the same components. It's just a different sequence. You just have to remember the sequence of whether is it the lymph duct first, lymph nodes, lymph capillaries, lymph vessels or the subclavian veins. Do just try and see the correct order of the flow of lymph in the lymphatic system. Did you get it right? Because the answer is B. B because, remember, the lymph will flow from the capillaries to the vessels flowing through the nodes and the major lymph ducts finally ending either in the right or the left subclavian veins. That's why the answer is option B. It's okay if you did not get this right. We have many other questions. Now, next one. One of the functions of lymphatic system in transport is to A. Enable the diffusion of waste products like carbon dioxide and urea from the cells into the interstitial fluid. B. Maintain the body's internal environment always at a normal range via homeostatic process. C. Enable the diffusion of oxygen nutrients from blood into the cells. D. Absorb fatty acids, glycerol and fat soluble vitamins and transport them into the blood circulatory system. So, yeah, do really carefully think about it because it may be quite a tough question. Now, if you read carefully the question, it is about the function of the lymphatic system. So, the first option, let's run through them. Um, it is true that there is diffusion of waste products from cells into interstitial fluid. That statement is right. But is that a function of the lymphatic system? I don't think so. It is not. Option B. Maintain body's internal environment always at normal range. Now that's the job of homeostasis and not the job of the lymphatic system. So, option B is out. Option C, diffusion of oxygen nutrients from blood into the cells. Now it's true, this statement is right in itself that there is diffusion of oxygen and nutrients from blood into cells. But that is not the function of the lymphatic system. So clearly this only leaves out option D and that is the answer because as I even drew on the board that one of the functions of the lymphatic system, which is a special lymph capillary, is to absorb fatty acids, glycerol, fat soluble vitamins, you know, and to transport them back into the blood circulatory system. So the answer is option D. 
Now, let us look at the next one about elephantiasis is a disease caused by A. Lymph that is unable to flow back into the blood circulatory system. B. Interstitial fluid unable to flow into the lymphatic system. C. Blockage of blood vessels in the legs. D. Blockage of lymphatic vessels by parasitic filarial worms. Ah, this is a rather tricky question. So I would like you to take some time out to really process carefully the options. So you got your answer. Now let's look at option A. Lymph unable to flow back into the blood circulatory system. Now this one, we never even mention about it that, um, that usually lymph will definitely be able to return back into the blood circulatory system via the left and the right subclavian veins, via the two major lymph ducts, which will be the thoracic duct and the right lymphatic duct. So obviously A is wrong. How about B? If the interstitial fluid cannot flow into the lymphatic system, but that's not really one of the things that we discuss because if the statement is rephrased that interstitial fluid unable to flow back into the capillaries or into the blood circulation, ah, then it might be true. Then it causes swelling of tissue. But this is interstitial fluid unable to flow into the lymphatic system, which is not true. Okay? Now, so B is out. C, blockage of blood vessels. Wouldn't that be called a thrombosis, right? Blockage of blood vessels because there's a thrombus or an embolus and therefore uh, blood flow is blocked. So that doesn't cause elephantiasis. So that's why the only answer is D, which is blockage of lymphatic vessels by parasitic filarial worms. So I hope that um, you were able to get um, the answer for that question, option D. But don't worry if you didn't, okay, because I think you just need to really uh, practice a lot more. Okay. Let's look at some short structure questions. The first one being, what is oedema? Explain one cause of oedema. Now, what do you think it is? Yes, I'm sure you all will be able to answer this. It is a condition when the excess interstitial fluid does not flow back into the blood circulatory system, not into the lymph, but back into the blood circulatory system. Instead, it accumulates and causes swelling of tissues. An example of oedema is elephantiasis, which is a disease caused by parasitic worms which stay in the lymphatic vessels and cause blockage of the vessels. This results in swelling of body parts such as the legs and the male genitals. And the worms are brought into the human body by mosquitoes. So elephantiasis is um, quite a complex disease because one of the symptoms of elephantiasis will be oedema. And oedema is seen and is diagnosed by um, you know, swelling, swelling of tissues. And why do tissues swell? It is because the excess interstitial fluid doesn't flow back into the blood. So they're left, you know, um, in the intercellular spaces leading to the swelling of tissues. And because of that, when the tissues swell, this will cause some swelling of certain body parts, especially the legs. And this elephantiasis is caused and brought into the body by mosquitoes and the mosquitoes bring a certain parasitic worm which actually stays in the lymphatic vessels and blocks the flow of the lymphatic fluid. So I hope that you have a clear understanding of edema and elephantiasis. Now let us look at another short structure question. Explain the flow of lymph in the lymphatic system. 
Now this is also the last question. Now, I think you can just roughly think of what you would write in the spaces if let's say this came out as an essay question in the exams. Yes, limp from the lymphatic vessels you would be writing throughout the body drains into two major lymph vessels or lymph ducts which are known as the right lymphatic duct and the thoracic duct. And the thoracic duct happens to be the largest lymphatic vessel in the body. The right lymphatic duct drains lymph from the right side of the body, from the right side of the head, neck, and chest, as well as the right arm into the right subclavian vein. Whereas the thoracic duct will drain lymph from the entire left side of the body. It drains from the left side of the head, neck, chest, left arm, lower trunk and both legs into the left subclavian vein. As a result, the lymph which originates from the blood is eventually returned to the blood circulatory system. So that actually ends our lesson on focusing on the lymphatic system. I hope you have a better understanding of it because that lesson is actually quite tough and complex. Well, thank you so much for watching ITTV. It was really nice to be able to share about certain important points and popular questions with regards to the lymphatic system. So with that, we hope that you have an enjoyable week and thank you once again.